it's a huge honor to be presenting here. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, I've missed Nigeria. This is the longest period I've been since I came last year. Um, and, and I also just miss seeing people. I, I miss parties. I miss all of the social life. I have to say, while I miss them, my, my wife is always slightly terrified about my excitement about going to parties because she says, so often I put my foot in it and say the wrong thing. Um, so I really appreciate Temi Papula inviting me. If I put my foot in it, it's just because he hasn't met my wife before and hasn't had the warning about the things I might say. So I, I hope I, I get this right um, and I don't uh, cause too many uh, controversies in this presentation. About 10 years ago at Renaissance Capital, we did a book uh, outlining the opportunities in Nigeria, um, the fastest billion, and we talked about what we felt the world wasn't seeing. What I've spent the last three, four years focusing on is the continuing challenges in Asia, Latin America to some extent, and Africa, that have helped countries start to industrialize and accelerate high growth. Um, and the key message, which will come out in this book in the next few months, is to do with savings. Um, and I'd like to talk you through those now because what it helps explain is why the capital markets are so essential for Nigeria. I mean, Nigeria is Africa. In the eyes of many global investors, not only the biggest economy, the biggest population, oil exporter and all the rest, but we do have issues. Um, the issue that, that oil produces, what, roughly a dollar a day um, sorry, yeah, for, for most for most Nigerians isn't, isn't enough to bring great wealth. It's a young country, which is fantastically helpful at one level when we have COVID, but also a challenge when it comes to savings. And I'm, and I'm going to get to that in a second. And when a country hasn't got enough savings, interest rates tend to be high. And therefore, the cost of investment tends to be high. So the question then is, where do the savings come from? How can you get savings into an economy? Um, the youth issue, you know, but it's dramatic, I think, to look at the median age in Nigeria of 16. Uh, my, my, one of my daughters is about to be 16, and she's got no savings. That I had no savings when I was 16. Um, as you get older, as countries get older, savings go up dramatically. Japan has had negative interest rates now for years, and that reflects what an aging society it is. So youth has its advantages, but it also means we have a shortage of savings. Can commodities make the difference? Well, as I've already hinted, probably not for Nigeria. Uh, if you're Botswana and you have a huge amount of diamonds uh, per capita, then your exports are what, two or three thousand dollars a head a year. In, in Nigeria, to get to Botswana's level of exports per person, we'd have to see the oil price at $400 a barrel. And that is global recession talk. So that's never going to happen. I've been using this graph for many years, highlighting exports per thousand people, how many barrels of oil get exported per thousand people. And the Gulf countries are lucky. Huge amount of oil, not many people. And they have hundreds of barrels of oil export every day. And Nigeria on the right-hand side uh, is, is around seven. So oil commodities are not going to do it. What will make Nigeria rich? The, the most important thing is its people. It's increasingly well-educated people. This is, a, this is my badly drawn map of Africa. Each box is one million people. The, the green... Uh, is when your adult literacy rate in any language is over 70%. A dark green is when it's over 80%. And that's what countries need to industrialize. Uh, and the great news for much of the continent is, is we're seeing that, and indeed for many states in Nigeria too. If you've got an adult literacy rate below 40%, that's the countries in gray, you tend to get civil disorder, civil war or coups. And we've seen coups in Mali, Chad and Guinea just this year, um, which, which fit with that. And I think the first pro problem is to do with 
there's not enough cash in the banks. There's not actually enough savings in the economy. Uh, if we look at bank lending in Nigeria, it's been around 20% of GDP for about 15 years. There was a pop-up in 07, 08 when oil prices were really high. That does help, but it hasn't, it's not producing the savings we need. But, but countries elsewhere in Africa do have them. Mauritius, Morocco, Tunisia, and they have the electricity that comes from those savings. And the work that's going to show up in this book and most of the longest chapter is all about this because it's hard to, uh, it took me a while to believe it. Um, it's, it's fertility rates. Uh, there was a study on China uh, that said that over half of the increase in savings, household savings in China, have come from the fertility rate dropping from six kids per woman on average to, well, under three already by 1980. And it wasn't just the one child policy. No one sh should be supporting that. So this fall in the fertility rate means that when you've got six kids, you haven't got money at the end of the week to put into a bank or to save, even to invest in MTN shares, um, unfortunately. So what we need to see is, is fertility rates coming down. And when they've come down, like Morocco has, bank deposits go up. In fact, I, I can show you the data for all of the world. And the, and the countries with the most deposits on the top left-hand corner of that chart, you probably can't read all those dots. Hong Kong, uh, Luxembourg, Japan, some of the oldest countries in the world have the highest savings. The youngest countries, the ones with the high fertility, have the low savings. And those blue columns you might be able to see on the top right, Nigeria is there at about five, six kids per woman on average. Um, it, it, bank deposits at this level are normally about 20% of GDP, as they are in Nigeria. But to get to that rocketing jump, we need to see two to three children. Now, that, that's not going to happen overnight. But what it explains then is why interest rates in some parts of Africa are as low as Asia, even lower than Asia. Actually, Mauritius and Morocco have lower interest rates than China. And China's got so many savings, they've been throwing them at anyone in the last five, five ten years. Um, but elsewhere in sub-Saharan, including Nigeria, interest rates are high. That means investment's expensive. So how can we get the savings into Nigeria when domestic savings are low? Oh, and I, I need to just point out one more thing, which is that when the ratio of adults to uh, children is about one for one, which is the story in Nigeria today, roughly 100 million kids, a little over 100 million adults, growth per capita tends to be about 1.4%. Countries boom when they start to age. And when they age too much, like Japan, you stop growing again. But, but Nigeria is 100 years away from that. The, the, the really fast growth is when you start to get two adults or two and a half adults per child. So the really good growth comes because there's a higher proportion of the population can work, because more of them are adults, but also because the savings have gone up because the country is getting older. And Nigeria is not going to have that for a while. Well. The United Nations says, and I really hope they're wrong, and the reason I'm writing this book is to try and make them wrong, There's, they reckon that the fertility rate in Nigeria is not going to go below three kids per woman until 2060. Now, that's saying we've got another 40 years of a lack of savings. I don't think that's necessary. We, we don't have to go have, see that. Um, but, but it's certainly true that in the 2020s, there's not enough savings. It's too late to change the demographics for this decade. So where can the savings, where can savings for growth come from? Domestic profits. You can do that. MTN's making profit. This is exactly what we want to see. Companies reinvesting their profits. Trouble is, when that's the only savings pool you've got, it's really slow growth. It's what the UK did. And no one should be trying to copy what the UK did. It took us 100 years to start to escape from poverty. We grow at one to 2% a year per capita. Everybody should be aiming to be a China 
which grew at six, seven, eight percent per capita. Vietnam, four or five percent. So that's that's helpful, but it's not enough. Government spending, there's limits, as I'm sure the finance minister will explain. <laughs> there isn't all the money in the world uh, in, in low income countries. So that's not an easy option. Foreign direct investment, very helpful. Um, and that'll play a role. But I feel that the country needs to do all it can to bring foreign money also into the debt markets, ideally domestic debt markets, so it doesn't carry an FX risk for Nigeria, and equity markets, because that doesn't even carry a debt risk for Nigeria. If you can get more foreign money into equity markets, you have that pool of cheap financing. And I, I promise I'm not too far away from, from ending, but the story today is, of course, you can borrow from abroad. The, the, the blue line here is showing you Japanese interest rates for the last 30 years, and, and they're negative. Germany in red is copying Japan as a lag on the data. I think we're going to see really low rates in Germany forever. And America tends to be fairly low borrowing costs too, because Germans and Japanese just put money into America if the yields go up too much. So my guess is US Treasury yields stay up under two, I, I hope, maybe two and a half in the next 10 years. And when that happens, of course, people say, where can I get more yield? And foreigners have been throwing money at emerging markets. It used to cost Brazil, Russia, 12% a year in dollars. 20 years ago to borrow money, 6% 10 years ago, now 4%. And these investors are saying, well, even 4% is not great for emerging markets. So where else can I lend? And, and they are lending to Africa. This is a set of countries showing you from 2015 to, to now. Eurobond issuance in, in Nigeria has gone from $5 billion to $20 billion. Do it. Makes sense. Borrow that capital from abroad when it's relatively cheap. Um, I, I think that's a good idea. Uh, but there are limits. If we look at government debt, it's 500% of revenues in Nigeria. And that's not as bad as Zambia, but Zambia's just defaulted. And it's not as bad as Ethiopia, but they've defaulted too. So that's, we're getting towards the limits. Now, I, I don't think we're there yet. If we, if we look at uh, interest payments, and I use total revenues for these charts, but this is interest payments to revenues or interest payments to GDP. Nigeria doesn't look too bad. It, it's got room to borrow more. Um, this is typical economists. We give you the same set of data, show it in different ways, and it tells you two completely different messages. It's when the message is all the same from all the charts. That's when it's dangerous. Um, we're not there yet. Um, and then we look at external debt. And, and Nigeria is on the right-hand side here. It's gone up a lot, but relative to many other countries on the continent, actually, Nigeria can borrow more externally. So some dollar debt is part of the answer. I, I'm, I'm not denying that. But it's not going to last. Um, it's not sustainable forever. Um, so then we have the issue of the currency. One of the other ways to get capital into a country is through a current account surplus. And, and in the middle of this overly complicated table, I'm sorry, is the IMF forecast saying we're going to run deficits uh, into next year. Do you know where we are now in, in the program? We, we are st still in Charlie Robinson speaking, if, <laughs> if everyone can hear all the voices. The point of this complicated table is to show that both my model in London um, of 548 for the fair value for the currency says it's too strong. Yvonne's model, this is our Africa economist based in Johannesburg, she's got a model which says fair value is 451. I'm given the choice between trusting someone like me or an African woman, always trust the woman. Um, and, and actually I do uh, at the moment because her model is premised on about $80 oil. But this is basically the message here is that the currency is a bit too strong. And, and foreigners at the moment, as you know, are being deterred from coming into the market by the problem of getting money out. So I'm going to finish on this slide. Nigeria's choices. The domestic savings from a lower fertility rate, that's not going to happen in the 2020s. 
it's it's too late to, to make a change there. We can hope for a massive boom in the oil price that will produce a current account surplus, but that's not in Nigeria's control. We could have a cheaper currency policy to produce a current account surplus. That's not the policy choice being taken at the moment. You can borrow more money, and, and I'm sure Nigeria will in the next two years, to try and produce the cheap, relatively low-cost borrowing for investment. And I think that that's going to happen, and that will help. That will help produce some growth. Foreign investment, though, is essential. And, and I would personally argue strongly in favor of trying to keep that in local currency in the longer run and as much as possible into equities. And this is where the capital markets, I think, are not just essential for Nigeria, but they're one of the only choices that Nigeria can make is to try and get that inflow via the capital markets. Thank you very much. And I do apologize if I've overstepped the mark anywhere. Um, again, an honor to speak with you. Make investing in the capital market seamless and easier. And also give as many Nigerians as possible the opportunity to invest in the capital market using a digital platform without having to go and find a broker and fill forms and go back and forth. So that will drive uh, investments. The government on its part also has set up a number of measures to ensure savings on a continuous basis. So one of it is the Nigerian Development Investment Authority, the COA is here. I'm sure he will speak to what they are doing. But we've also uh, set up uh, a poverty investment fund and uh, a crisis investment fund we have a number of special funds, like the Natural Resource Development Fund. Those are all savings instruments. When we had the COVID-19 pandemic, we were able to uh, go into some of the special savings and take a 500 billion naira that was infused directly into the economy to support the implementation of the economic sustainability. Our weakest link today still remains the level of revenues that. Um, we're able to generate, but even that is improving on an ongoing basis. Today, we can say that uh, some of the efforts that uh, the administration has focused on an increasing non-oil revenues are working. To the extent that as of September, our non-oil revenue performance is about 117% of the prorated target, which means we're actually even exceeding the targets that we have set ourselves and we're stretching those targets more also in 2022 to 2025. We've also just got approval for the national new national development plan. And um, we had a lot of inputs from the capital market participants in this. We're looking at how to continuously support investments to attract more equity into the capital market. We've used the instruments of finance bills 2019 and 2020. And also currently the 2022 finance bill to ensure that to, to provide incentives that in foreign investments when they come actually stay for much longer periods, not just taking advantage of the market, which can have very handsome yields, but coming to stay at least for some reasonable period of time. And if they exit early, there's a cost to doing that. So we'll continue to work with the capital market participants to deepen the market, to take advantage of the opportunities that uh, in, the, uh, in the domestic uh, market so that more investments are in patient capital. I would like, I would like to probably that. build on that, your cooperation with the capital market authorities, to say that um, during the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, I was the Minister of Finance. Yes, it was a crisis at that time. What we had to do to face the crisis and to limit its impact on the, both the domestic economy and the capital market, was we set up a very powerful team on the government side, led by the vice president at the time, I think who became uh, uh, President Jonathan, who became president later, uh, with six governors from, one from each zone, key ministers and so on. And I remember on behalf of that committee, I had to go to Lagos a couple of times to interact with the capital market authorities. Now, the VP in his presentation today also talked about cooperation with the capital market. How are we going to create this partnership? 
Um, I would like to suggest that what you need, we had that kind of team that time to address an emergency. And I think we are still in that emergency. So can you consider the possibility of setting up such a team involving this time, not only the government side, but key participants of the market together so that you have an ongoing, not just one that is set up to just do one thing, but maybe a continuous uh, a forum that can be used to address the issue of this partnership with the capital market on a regular basis. Uh, Dr. Shamsuddin, that's an, uh, a very good suggestion. We already have, I think, the team that worked on, on the policy it was actually a, a broad-based one, and the large numbers in that committee were some government agencies, but largely capital market uh, participants. We'll revisit that committee and see if uh, we can take from those committee members to have, let me say, something like a fiscal advisory committee that will be working on a more regular basis in partnership with government so that we can take advantage of the opportunities where they come and also work towards working together to mitigate the risks as they arise. So that's an excellent suggestion. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Let me move on to Dr. Kaede Faemi. Your Excellency, I will combine two questions for you so that to save time. The first one is in your role as the governor of Ekiti State. You just had your economic and investment summit. What role have you provided for the capital market to help implement your investment and uh, development effort? Uh, the second question is putting on your hat as chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum. Um, I know, and I give you a lot of credit for the way you've turned the secretariat of that forum to a highly, uh, uh, you know, highly um, managed with expertise to advise state governments in a number of areas, particularly budgeting, finance, and so on, working closely with the World Bank. Um, how much use of the capital market uh, are you encouraging through that effort? Again, my question, can you use that forum, that instrument that you've already established that is providing support to the state governments to encourage them to use the capital market uh, more effectively? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osman, for the question. And let me also associate myself with the comments of the Honorable Minister uh, in congratulating NGX um, for convening this uh, forum. Um, luckily, in responding to your question about the Governor's Forum, my capital market advisor is here. So it would, it would give you a lot of details uh, in terms of our engagement uh, process, but, but for us at the forum, what drives what we do is primarily peer learning. And the experience you've seen when you came to talk to us about our work with SIFTAS uh, is also informed by that. And that has significantly improved transparency, accountability, and access to finance also uh, for many states. But as I said, Godwin will give more details uh, in terms of the opportunities that are there, because what we've done with SIFTAS in partnership with the World Bank, we can also do with NGX uh, in relation to the capital market and provide a secretariat backup for states in engaging um, professionals in the capital market. So details will be given. Uh, by Godwin on that. But let me speak to the first question, which is really my, my primary responsibility why I'm elected into office. In the state, we're no strangers to the capital market. Even before I became governor, our first uh, executive governor pioneered that move. Uh, when Governor Niyadebayo was in office, he engaged the capital market. And the market provided a platform, particularly NAC, for us to be able to access 
bond opportunities, and we use that for many regenerative projects, including uh, our hotel here in Abuja. If you go down this Hilton Street, you see the Akiti House, which uh, uh, used to house Nanny Suit, and we had a turnover of many operators of that facilities. But the important point is that it's regenerative, and we've used it to raise a lot of revenue for the state detail the fountain cuts in, in Lagos. But following um, the investment summit, we have seen a number of ways in which we think opportunities exist for the capital market to play. First, as I said, we engage at the level of the state uh, in accessing bonds and other opportunities. But we think in our exchanges, we the market that there are other ways to, to engage first. We have a number of state-owned enterprises that we're really getting out of. And we've managed to concession many of these, so many of these to private sector operators who have tremendous capacity to turn around such institutions. But many of them still confront challenges in raising capital. Uh, so it's not about expertise in terms of uh, driving such institutions to profitability. It's more often to do with the response of the capital market. And we've demonstrated that this is possible. We've had one of our state-owned enterprises divested to a company like Promacido, uh, which produces milk, cowbell milk. And since we did that, Promacido produces on a monthly basis in the kitchen now, 100,000 liters of milk from that company that had been moribund for 40 years. So that's the way that we think state-owned enterprises can also benefit from engagement with the capital market. We've also done an innovative initiative. I mean, part of the challenge is that bonds are limited. This seven-year frame does not provide opportunities for you to uh, raise money at a lower interest that is much more attractive to many uh, players. So we've, we've, we've tried the annuity PPP with uh, InfraCredit, working with NSIA and, and, and partners for some of our infrastructure projects. And this gives a 20-year uh, uh, window to be able to raise funds at a much significantly lower interest rate. And this also offers uh, opportunity that I think the capital market needs to uh, 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 work with. And finally, I think that there are opportunities now for our capital market to begin to look at the wider market. I mean, there is something that they do in the United States. I think it's special purpose acquisition companies uh, that, I mean, this year alone, I think they've raised about $140 billion. And these are private entities in partnership with states that have been able to access such funds. So our capital market, talking about innovation for sustainable recovery, needs to start looking beyond the traditional way uh, of, of, of raising capital uh, uh, in, in the sector. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Governor Faimi. I think... Um, I should move over to obviously the advisor, not only to the chairman governor's forum, but obviously by implication, the advisor to all governors on the capital market. And I can also say that from my own knowledge, he's actually a capital market guru himself. How much use of the capital market have you used uh, in Ondo State. Again, I have been to your state um, where you have hosted me. I've been around and seen the quality of projects that you've implemented. Uh, have you actually used the capital market for any of these projects? And what are your plans going forward? Because you've also just recently done your investment summit. Thank you very much. Um, first, let me congratulate management of the NTX. Uh, for the strides that you've made since I left you a few years ago. Um, to answer your question, sir, on, uh, well, 
I'll say for us in Edo State, unfortunately, we haven't used the capital market to the extent that is expected or we should have. Uh, because the, for us, we see that there has to be an alignment between a process, a state process, and the market. The market is a long-term, a market for long-term capital. So the market needs to see that the, the state has a, you know, a long-term program that aligns with its capital needs. Um, I'm sure my chairman of our forum, if he went to the market today to say he wants to raise money for a kid, nobody will listen to him. Nobody will talk to him because they'll say, your tenure comes to an end next year. Absolutely. Therefore, the market is not going to give you money as if a kid state is equal to Dr. Fayemi. Um, and the reason is because over time, states or uh, subnational entities haven't come up with their term programs. They're like a long-term development programs. And so what we've tried to do in Edo State is to now begin to look out 30 years. So we are working on a 30-year uh, development plan broken into lots of you know, five years. So you have six terms of five years, each term equating to a political election cycle, but being very clear as to what the investment needs needs to be into the long term to drive growth. So if, for instance, as we have decided to diversify, to focus on oil palm, I've allocated about 50,000 hectares of you know, a degraded land for oil palm cultivation, for instance. That investment is likely to bring in in excess of $200 million. But I need to invest in a critical infrastructure like a road that will cost me maybe $5, 10000000 million to take, you know, traffic into that particular, you know, area of investment. So we, we've got to you know, as, as subnationals think very carefully the type of infrastructure that we need to invest in that will engender and lead growth. And it's when we have those sort of well thought out programs that you can now come to the market, that is when the market will take you seriously and know that whatever you are borrowing or whatever your capital you are raising for particularly uh, for a particular in, uh, investment or infrastructure investment, May transcend, will transcend the tenor of any particular administration. The, yes, we have not been in the main market, but we've been raising long term capital because over the last few years, the market has come up with very interesting, innovative um, st structures for governments to raise capital for specific projects. Unfortunately, these transactions are off you know, of the balance sheet of states and of the markets, and therefore don't have the kind of liquidity that they could attract. And why have we done this? Because if a state goes to the market today, if I were going to go to the market to say I want to raise money, by the time I go through DMO, go through SEC and all the issues they will raise, I just find out that it's just so, un, you know, it's, it just takes so much out of you. You know, it's like the regulations we have today need to be reviewed. You know, the regulations were put in place many years ago when they thought that governors came into the market to raise money and steal the money. And that is not the case anymore. It's like the market is much smarter than that. So if I have a project that is viable as a state, I should be able to go into the market, deal with my financial advisors, and get them to raise the money without the regulatory encumbrances that we have today. That is one of the reasons why some of us who understand and know the market have decided, or well, have not approached the market directly, but have raised monies um, in other forms. And very quickly to the issue of states. Um, under you know, the World Bank program, which we term SIFTAS, which is a state's fiscal transparency, accountability, and sustainability program, 
we fortunately were able to raise additional funding, totaling about 1.5 billion US dollars from the World Bank. And this, was, you, thanks to the Federal Ministry of Finance, was uh, extended to states as grants to help them, like, you know, you know put little, literally put, behave well fiscally. Well, thank you very much, Alaji, uh, uh, Dr. Shamsuddin, and thank you very much, the NGX, for this invitation, for this platform. I congratulate you. And um, say well done also to all the members of the panel, and particularly Charles Robertson for that very insightful presentation. Um, CIFTAS has helped uh, in many ways uh, in transforming uh, and reforming our systems in our various states, uh, engendering and entrenching uh, transparency in government uh, business, and also strengthening uh, institutions of governance. And um, uh, talking and answering the, uh, about the question you have asked about um, the term of office, I believe that uh, uh, the technical advisor, our technical advisor, Governor Obasiki, had uh, scratched on the issue. We must stop seeing government as about individuals or an individual governor. Like he said, Governor Fayemi is hopefully leaving the office by October uh, 2022. And um, uh, most of us uh, who are serving their second term are leaving uh, by May 29th uh, of 2023. We must begin to see governments as governments, not individualizing or personalizing governments and governors. And um, government as continuum. Uh, if, if you have... Um, a program uh, that uh, is good for the state, uh, the, the capital market, for example, and its regulators should look at the program, not at the individual governor or the, the term he's having. And, and, and when, you, when you actually reform, uh, uh, said and suggested by Governor uh, Obasaki, uh, the, the processes and the, and, the, and, and the regulations around uh, the capital market, you should be able to now also factor this into it. Uh, that uh, when, when you are dealing with a state, you are dealing with, with a soft national. You are dealing with something like a country, not the individual leader or governor of, of that particular state, just as the way you don't deal with the president of a country and you don't treat him as such. Uh, and I, I also like to use this advantage of, uh, of this uh, platform, most of the Minister of Finance is here, to, to, to kindly suggest that uh, they should loosen the central government should loosen the hold they are having uh, on, on subnational access to funds. Uh, that will engender more growth and more activity, and, and which will now spur a lot of more, uh, of more, more economic activity in, 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 uh, at the grassroots, uh, especially, for example, uh, in, in, in issues of uh, intervention in power and, and, and supplementing what the federal government is doing in providing power, which will unleash development or leash or uh, industrialization, and also uh, agriculture, for example, investments in agriculture. We need more funding, there's so much of this, uh, and we need more funding in housing and all of that. So I believe that it is time for, for all of us to work closely and for the NGF uh, and the NGX to come closer using this platform uh, to work towards ensuring that uh, uh, subnational and uh, uh, properly guided in how to access uh, funding of, uh, through, through uh, the capital market. From our experience here in Sokoto, this is the first time we are, we are going to approach uh, the capital market uh, to, to, to source for funding of equipping uh, our own state university teaching hostel that is coming up, uh, about 1,250 bed capacity university teaching hostel. Uh, it is on class, which we believe will go a long way in addressing the challenge of uh, medical tourism and providing uh, quality healthcare service, not only to the people of Sokoto State, but to the entire sub-region and even some of our neighbors. So, so it is time for federal government actually to, to, to do some introspection in relation to how they deal with subnationals on access to funding. Uh, in this yeah, case, of course, yeah, 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 Excellency, let me interrupt you there. You are asking the federal government to loosen its hold on the subnationals. 
the issue of the state governments themselves loosening their hold on the local governments is also very important. When I was managing director of NAL, Merchant Bank, which was the foremost issuing house at the time, we actually were able to take two local government issues in the capital market, to have local governments come into the market to raise money. Now, this is not happening at all now. What are your thoughts? And I'm happy that um, you are covered by two other governors here. Um, I know you've done a lot of work, for example, even under the CIFTAS, of giving financial autonomy to the local governments in Sokoto State. But what are your thoughts on, because it also requires you at your level of the states to also free up the local government so that they can, uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, well uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. I, I believe that, uh, as you rightly suggested, that it's also the need for, for some more kind of uh, 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 freeing of, of local governments by, by subnational governments, by state governments, especially in areas where our states whereby uh, we still have uh, states controlling the, 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 the funds of the local government. But you, you, you should also know that for us to achieve that, there is the, the need for us to transform the system of the local government administration in our respective states by ensuring that uh, we have uh, uh, their the, 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 the systems uh, strengthened and, uh, and being brought up to date, which SIFTAS is also helping uh, in providing. So I think it's work in progress. We, we, we should all do the, 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 the two at the same time. Uh, loosening the, 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 the hold on the subnational and as well as, uh, as local government. I'm sure the chairman of Bonus Forum may want to say something on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll come back to the chairman governor's forum later. Let me move on to Mr. Uchi Oji, the uh, CEO of the NSIA. I think, Mr. Oji, I would like you to focus on one area. We've been talking about the spending of the capital now, the spending side, but the sourcing side, uh, the harnessing of the capital, as the vice president said, how do we harness this capital? You are the institution that you represent in other countries, particularly in OPEC countries, since we are a member of OPEC, have been a major source of actually raising capital to be used in not only the domestic economy, but international um, capital market. What has been the situation regarding the capitalization of the NSIA itself? And what effort are you making in terms of ensuring that you improve on your capitalization so as to bring more resources into the capital market? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I, I like that question because the two biggest shareholders representing NSIA happen to be on this panel as well. So the Minister of Finance and the Chairman of the Governors Forum. So many of you don't know this. The NSIA is actually not one fund. It's actually a fund owned by the states, the local governments, and it's the federal government. So every single local government, every single state, and the federal government all have share certificates. So it's, it's uh, a contribution of everybody. Now, to the point about um, the size and the relative, uh, uh, relative comparison with the other OPEC states, I think it's important to contextualize it. Um, the first is, many of the OPEC states you mentioned, um, or you referred to, started very early. Qatar started their sovereign wealth fund in 1956. Um, Abu Dhabi started in 1973 or 74, right after the uh, oil boom. So, and for many years, those companies or those countries they didn't really achieve much, they didn't, they didn't hear about them because they took time methodically to grow those funds. And it's only been in the late 90s and early 2000s you started to see those funds become important. So it's important to think about the context of time. The Sovereign Wealth Fund of Nigeria was only started in 2012. So I think it's important to contextualize it. Secondly, is how much you put in the fund at the beginning. Uh, without a doubt, we missed an opportunity in 2012 when the Sovereign Wealth Fund was started because at the time the objective was to put a significant sum into it. Uh, we didn't. Uh, Norwegians were putting $1 billion a week aside in their sovereign wealth fund throughout the last seven years. 
every week. So if you really want to talk about capitalization, you need to think about it in those contexts. So I think it's important to contextualize it that way. Now, having said that, uh, from where we are today, and just one last point of context. Uh, four years ago, we commissioned a study um, uh, with Alexander Forbes to ask them, at what point do you think a sovereign wealth fund needs to grow big enough to become meaningful in its economy? Uh, that study came back with a result that said 5 to 10% of GDP. So if you're looking at that in the context of Nigeria's GDP, you're talking 20 to $40 billion. We are very far off that. So what are we going to do? Uh, three or four things, and I'm going to keep my answer very short. I think there are four things that can be done um, in terms of um, capitalizing this uh, a little bit better. The first is actually and something we've started to do is the creation of co-investment vehicles. So instead of the NSIA carrying all the burden itself, it creates a vehicle that allows other people to participate. We did that successfully in an agriculture fund we created recently, and we're about to do that in a healthcare fund. So gradually, we expect that that will become a way to actually bring other pools of capital to participate. The objective with this will be to, for every $1 spent by the NSIA, hopefully you can mobilize 4 to $5. Um, one of the other vehicles, of course, is Infraco, which the Vice President mentioned earlier. The NSI is hoping to take a piece of Infraco, about 10, maybe 15% stake in Infraco, that allows it then to go and raise capital from outside. So that's one way to grow it. A second way to grow it will be to look at what you do with your moribund assets or assets that are under, 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 underutilized. Um, and I'll give you two examples here. Um, the first is what has been done by Temasek. Uh, many of you don't realize it, but Singapore has two sovereign wealth funds. One is GIC, which is cash. The second one is Temasek, which is assets. And what it did was it took all their assets and put it in a vehicle and created a fund around it. Um, and that fund went from $78 million, Singaporean dollars, when they started doing this in late 70s, to now about 200 billion uh, Singaporean dollars. So you can actually get some of your assets that are not properly managed into a fund. I mean, Saudi also did that recently. Saudi Aramco is owned by PIF, which is a sovereign wealth fund, went public $2 trillion, and that is how you suddenly became the biggest sovereign wealth fund in the world. So some of the assets that can be utilized are also another way to fund the sovereign wealth fund. The third thing is obviously um, organic growth. Organic growth is a bit challenging for us. Um, and I think, um, I mean, we're doing what we can. Last year, we were up uh, significant. I think we did 160 billion naira in profit this year. So far, so good. We're looking at so far, I mean, as at the end of September, um, you know, touch with the year hasn't ended. I really don't want to change these things, but the numbers are also not looking so bad. But that's, as the uh, presenter said, growing through savings is really not the right, it's, it's a, not a very effective way to grow quickly enough to address more of your needs. <laughs> And then the final thing I think is the things that we're working on and we've done successfully with some of the entities mentioned here. And that is creating financial markets, uh, infrastructure companies that can actually help you mobilize capital. And I'll give an example, what we did with InfraCredit. The InfraCredit's role is actually in providing what they call bond wraps or bond guarantees to help you raise bonds. Um, the NSI sponsored that company. We developed it, we wrote the business plan. We started with better investors into it. And what do they do? You raise a bond instrument. But when you go to market, perhaps your bond is going to cost you 20%. You come back to InfraCredit. InfraCredit provides a wrap around that bond. And you can go back to the market and the bond price can drop by seven, eight, nine points in some cases. So that's been very, very helpful in helping companies become uh, uh, able to tap into the market. So these are some of the, I mean, of course, we're in NG Clearing. We uh, developed uh, Nigeria Mortgage and Financing Company, Development Bank of Nigeria. All of these vehicles are very important. And they're important because they help create a financial market system that actually ends up making it easy for people to raise capital. But to your question, the size isn't really there yet to be completely meaningful, but you also need to contextualize that with time. Um, hopefully, you know, but of course, time is a moving target in itself. But again, that 10, maybe 15, 20 years of consistent contribution, I think that's very important. Consistent support, consistent contribution by the shareholders is one way for the organization to become meaningful in its contribution. Thank you. I think maybe even though we are in the public uh, view, in case you don't have the actual very foundation of your organization was laid by me. I hope you know that. I know that. <laughs> if, you, if you don't, maybe I can give you a copy of the memo that I wrote to President Eradua, asking him to accept that Nigeria must, like other OPEC countries, establish a sovereign investment authority. And when he approved it, I took the memo to the Federal Executive Council, as well as to the Nigerian 
I mean, Nigerian economic, um, the, the NEC, uh, economic National Council. Economic Council. And I recall after presenting that memo, some of the governors, and I won't mention names, asked, why are we doing this? I say, we are trying to save against a rainy day. And one of the governors said, it's raining in my state already. <laughs> I, I would not mention the name of that. <laughs> Let me move Just on. Just to say that it eventually had total support of all. Yes. Uh, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> but I, honestly, what it doesn't have up to now, and unfortunately, things are so tight. And that was the rationale for doing things. At that time, oil prices were about $100 per barrel. We needed to do, you know, to, to, to save. But the amount that is being put in there uh, is really, uh, you know, is still inadequate as, as mentioned. Now, Jimmy Popola, first of all, let me join others in congratulating you for conceiving and achieving this conference. Uh, highly commendable. But the same question as I asked the Honorable Minister of Finance, what measures are being taken by your board and the capital market authorities generally in reviving and revamping the Nigerian capital market. Because unfortunately, since that global financial crisis, there's been some recovery, but we really haven't, I don't think, gone back to that pre-crisis level and beyond, like has happened in some of the uh, uh, markets. Um, maybe let, let's start with that. Thank you very much. Uh, I will keep the comments very brief because of time. Uh, let me start by maybe speaking to historically what the exchange has done to address this question that you ask. And uh, when His Excellency Governor Fayemi was speaking, he spoke, for example, about SPACs. Uh, the exchange has had a very strong history of innovation. I'm happy that Mr. Yema is here. You know, he drove a lot of that um, innovation and thinking. So SPACs, for example, is something that the exchange is currently working with the apex regulator on. I think some would say that maybe we're weeks away, uh, depending on the uh, regulator's um, uh, approvals to uh, being able to uh, introduce SPACs to our market. Uh, and there's quite some history of products like that and ideas like that. Uh, of course, as you know, the exchange works uh, with levels of governance and regulation uh, that we have to subject ourselves to. Uh, away from that, how are we thinking about addressing this question that you raise? Uh, what we find out very quickly is that to address that, there are certain things that are within our control. Uh, and there are a lot of things as well that are outside our control. If you look, for example, at what the key metrics are for a vibrant capital market, uh, one of them is just the macroeconomic environment. How is the economy? How is the political situation? Uh, those things typically outside the control of an exchange. Uh, but away from that, what we are looking to do is um, increased wow. um, you know, uh, penetration of financial market products. So you start first and foremost by thinking about um, just financial literacy. Uh, people need to know that the capital markets exist and that the capital markets are mechanisms for addressing problems and for creating wealth. It's why we've set up a day like this. Uh, away from that, of course, is questions around really how then do you distribute some of these products? Uh, we spoke to technology earlier uh, as an example. Uh, and then, of course, on top of that is what exactly do we have as potential solutions on our platform? Uh, and again, back to how the governor was speaking earlier, Governor Fayemi, that we need to move away from some of the more traditional products uh, and to think of other products. So there's a lot of emphasis on product innovation uh, and just originating new ideas on the exchange. I think the final thing I would say is, again, back to technology and speaking to the future part of this event. Uh, it's very clear to our mind that the way to really unlock this issue uh, back to those things within our control is through technology. How can we get closer to a lot of the technology companies? How can we apply technology to the way that people consume the products on the exchange and to make sure that we can democratize that last mile 
uh, on the exchange. Thank you.